The scriptures that we're reading today are from the lectionary. And I, I want to offer one disclaimer uh, about one of the, the words, the name of a place. Uh, I've never bothered to look it up uh, because at summer camp one year when I was counseling, uh, uh, Ed Hart, Pastor Ed Hart, uh, told this story, and he pronounced the word penile, uh, which is not the way everybody does it, but it's in uh, memory of, of the late Ed Hart uh, and his ministry with uh, the children that were gathered uh, for that summer week, uh, however many years ago, uh, in, in hot, dry West Texas. Uh, at the spot where uh, campers would worship uh, as tradition had it, uh, both in the morning and in the evening, uh, along a, a dry creek uh, with a, a tree with three pieces to its trunk uh, that was known as the Trinity tree. And every now and then uh, someone would say at a camp board meeting, we ought to cut it down. Um, because it was always having to be shorn up because of erosion uh, and, and the fact that there was not enough water that flowed through the creek anymore to really keep the Trinity tree alive. But it was not a debate that it ever went anywhere because it was always shouted down. Uh, and I trust that uh, in, in some form or fashion, uh, kids gather by it continually. Ed Hart, the Trinity tree, uh, and this story uh, that concludes, uh, or is almost the conclusion uh, of the Jacob narrative uh, from the book of Genesis. The same night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his 11 children and crossed the ford with Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and likewise, everything that he had. Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel saying, for I have seen God face to face and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penal, limping because of his hip. So may the Lord's blessing be added to this reading of the word. Thanks be to God. Amen. I have these marvelous glasses, which they tell me are the, are the best uh, they can offer me. Uh, my hearing aids are in the process of being replaced. Uh, so if I seem a little deaf as well as a little blind, uh, I turned 70 on the 21st of July. Uh, thank you. Uh, it was the same day uh, that Oppenheimer opened. Uh, and Sarah said to me, perhaps uh, you'll want to talk about it. Um, since you're going to preach on the spirituality of movies. Uh, I thought at that point it was too late to turn down the assignment. So we're moving ahead. Uh, but I remember something that my father said in a sermon once as he was getting ready to uh, wade into a, a, a topic that he thought might have some controversy about it. Uh, when the Vietnam War Memorial uh, was being dedicated in Washington, D.C. There had been a lot of protest, a lot of back and forth between uh, people of different temperaments and, and beliefs. 
uh, people whose convictions varied one from another. And he said in beginning the sermon um, that he did not presume to say anything uh, that could not be contested. Uh, and, and I would offer the same. Uh, I, 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 I'm humbled uh, to be with you uh, on Hiroshima Day um, and the fact that uh, Oppenheimer was released uh, when it was obviously is, is not mere happenstance. Um, and so uh, with, with uh, our hearts open to all those who suffered then and, and continued to suffer and all those who continue uh, to work for peace, uh, we lift our hearts. There uh, was a, a word I was given once that uh, has both a scientific and a sort of mystic connotation that refers to the nature of things or the, or the substance of things being changed. Uh, and the word is alchemy. Um, if you're a chemist, you know uh, more about it than I do, I promise. Um, but when we have communion, we, we remember that uh, people in the early church would debate uh, what they called the presence. Was it a spiritual presence? Uh, was it merely a symbolic meal? Was the Lord somehow physically present? Um, and alchemy is sort of like that, um, in that uh, the substance of things can change. Um, and I mention it uh, in more of a mystic way. Um, and I, and, and set, setting it up this way, I'm referring back uh, to the end of the Jacob narrative, when the substance uh, of the relationship was altered. And it was altered on Esau, the wronged person's part. Now, a little bit of, of recap about the relationship between these two people. The rivalry and uh, the wrongdoing went all the way back uh, to the time of these two twins being born. They were the grandsons of Abraham uh, and Sarah. Uh, they, they were the children uh, of Isaac and Rebekah. Uh, and it was Jacob um, who was the second born uh, and therefore, according to tradition at the time, the blessing of the father uh, was to fall upon the first born uh, who was uh, Jacob's uh, Jacob's twin, Esau. But the story uh, in, includes a deception, uh, some favoritism, uh, because uh, Jacob, uh, the second born, was the favorite of his mother. And as the story goes, uh, to try to uh, put it in a nutshell, uh, uh, old blind Isaac uh, was deceived. Uh, they, with, with the help of, of his mother, uh, 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 Isaac's wife, Rebecca, uh, Jacob was dressed up in, in animal hair, uh, made more to resemble his, his brother, uh, and he stole the blessing. He even goes back uh, to the womb. It said that he was uh, such a rascal that in exiting the womb, he grabbed his brother by the heel in an effort to get out first. So the trouble between these two went way back. Um, and where we pick up the story in the Genesis narrative, uh, there is a reunion that is pending. Not the kind where you get invitations and bring gifts, but the kind where one person was nervous about what was surely vengeance merited uh, coming his way. What, uh, what, what Jacob was expecting from his twin Esau. Uh, and so the night before uh, the encounter, uh, he, he, he wrestles with, with, with an angel. Some say he wrestles with God. Uh, and that is the nature, that's the, the Hebrew pun involved, if you will. Israel uh, uh, contains two words, El being one of the words for God, Isra to wrestle or to struggle. Uh, the one who struggles with God. It's a marvelous name, uh, one that merits reflection, I think, in, in terms of uh, who these chosen people were. Uh, and Jacob, uh, this deceiver, uh, is one who, when he's 
getting ready to encounter a brother who he felt surely meant uh, him harm and would extract vengeance from him, uh, was concerned. He wrestles with the angel, but he survives. And he does uh, what Moses and others have always done, and that is wonder what to call God uh, in the hope, as, as uh, ancient people thought, as many of us still do, I suppose, that to be able to call God by name was a help in our relationship with God, uh, more to the point to get something of what we might want in a particular situation. The one who wrestles with God. But when he meets his brother, having sent him all kinds of, of gifts and uh, livestock and such, uh, so to sort of ease uh, what he felt was surely harm and vengeance that was to come his way, uh, when he encounters his brother, uh, his brother falls on his neck, uh, kisses and embraces him. Uh, and it, it is said that Jacob felt that to have encountered his brother in such a situation was like seeing God face to face, that reunion and healing has a spiritual quality uh, all of its own. The gospel according to Genesis today, if you will. Uh, the other reading, uh, and I just to put it in, in some context, and I'll say just a little bit more about it as, as we move along, uh, the feeding of the 5,000 in Matthew is interesting uh, for a number of reasons, but uh, particularly, I think, because if we move one chapter further uh, in Matthew's gospel, and, and remember, Matthew uh, is the first of the four gospels not because we believe it was the oldest uh, or the best, but the most Jewish. It has the most Old Testament quotes in it. And it's thought by scholars to have been intended as something of a bridge uh, between the Old Testament and the new. Uh, and in that regard, the feeding of the 5,000, as it was uh, once uh, exposited in my presence, uh, has a very Jewish tone about it. Right? There are five books uh, in the Pentateuch, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, uh, thought to, uh, to be the law, the, the summation of, of the Jewish law, if you will. Those five books, each with their uh, uh, different themes and, and purposes. But uh, five uh, 5,000 people, 12 baskets of leftovers, just as there were 12 tribes and 12 disciples, very Jewish. But if we move one chapter further in the 15th chapter of Matthew, and we have what is known as the feeding of the 4,000. And people say, now why was that? Well, I'll just offer you this thought, that it is set in a different uh, location. Uh, they have, Jesus and the disciples have moved through an area uh, called the Decapolis, meaning the 10 cities. And uh, they have that now, in essence, moved into Gentile territory. Um, and in that setting, um, there are 4,000 uh, 4, that are fed. Symbolic, uh, the, the argument goes, of the four corners of the earth. And there are uh, seven baskets of leftovers. In other words, meant to be a very inclusive uh, number in, in uh, ancient numerology. All the peoples of the earth. Uh, in this uh, seemingly most Jewish of settings now, or previously in that most Jewish of settings, now in something else, where all the peoples of the earth are invited uh, to come and eat. Uh, one of the things Sarah said to me uh, is that Pastor Art uh, would frequently use movies uh, in, in his sermon illustrations. Uh, I have, uh, as I say, as a kid that grew up next to a movie theater, uh, always felt like, why not? Uh, this is public discourse. It's, it's, it, these are shared stories. Uh, now, obviously not all cinema is, is equally memorable or, or great, um, uh, but for as troubling a movie as Oppenheimer is, um, I, I trust it is purposeful. Uh, 
said that the uh, it, it's based on a on a novel uh, that that in in the novel's prologue uh, refers to to the uh, ancient uh, Greek story that Prometheus uh, stole fire from the gods that somehow uh, this should not have happened uh, that, that making a, a, such a bomb uh, is is really something uh, we should never have done um, and should uh, should never detonate again. Um, I'm an old peacenik. Uh, no nukes. I, I'm I'm one of those people. And, and again, it, it, uh, referring to my father, I, I don't say that uh, as somebody that knows better than anybody else. Um, but uh, I, I I agree with with Lennon and McCartney, give peace a chance. And I'll say something about uh, John Lennon and Paul McCartney and Yoko Ono uh, in a few minutes. Texts, the argument goes, are meant to be read in community. We read scripture as individuals for our personal devotion, uh, but it is also, it has always had uh, a communal uh, dimension about it. That's why we read it when we come together. And uh, I think the same thing about movies. Um, if there's some part of the pandemic uh, that, that has plagued moviegoers, and we were talking about it uh, in the parking lot today, uh, when I had just get, gotten here, uh, churches suffer too, right? Attendance is down. People say, I think I'll, I'll, I'll do with religion what I, what I what I do with movies, I, uh, you know, Zoom and, and online viewing, terrific uh, as far as it goes, um, but there is something that we miss uh, when we uh, watch things or, or listen to things by ourselves without the benefit of others. These are things that were uh, given to us as a people. Uh, sometime, uh, uh, several decades ago, I suppose, uh, I, had, I was working at a, at a larger church and had the responsibility of helping to develop additional adult education classes. Um, and I was, I, I, when I went to a reunion at this church in, in Dallas, Texas, uh, the pastor was retiring actually. And uh, uh, I had this wonderful little gift from uh, one of the adult education leaders who told me that one of the books uh, that, that we had uh, uh, begun to study during my tenure there, uh, nearly 20 years prior, was still in use. Uh, and it was written by a, a Methodist scholar named Robert Jewett. Um, and the book is entitled St. Paul at the Movies. Uh, and, and the whole point of St. Paul at the Movies uh, was to reflect uh, on, on what some particular uh, script or, or plot uh, might have to offer the people. Um, as I say, uh, it, I come by this honestly in that my home was between uh, the movie theater and the church. Uh, I was a balcony guy, um, but I, as much as, as uh, I confess I enjoyed church as a kid, uh, probably most Saturdays I, I had a better time at the movies than I did at the church. But um, you may, may very well feel the same today, but uh, nonetheless, um, in this particular film, uh, Oppenheimer, that uh, Sarah told me she was gonna, uh, gonna watch before she made her way to see her family uh, in Virginia, uh, you have the, the definite sense um, that the world at least I, this is the way I understand the, the, the script uh, and the storyline, that the world is being asked to understand uh, how, how such a terrible thing happened, but also uh, being challenged to see to it uh, that it never happens again. I said that Old Testament uh, word Israel uh, means to struggle or to wrestle uh, with God. I grew up uh, as the preacher's kid next to the movie theater, but my father also loved wrestling. 
He had been a competitive wrestler in high school and in college, and he continued wrestling uh, even after college. And he was, because of the war, not a young college student. Uh, I used to collect little uh, plaques from his trophies. Uh, and uh, I had one, I did the math and realized that uh, in uh, 1957, he would have been 32 years old. He was still wrestling in open tournaments. And the story, the way it was told to me goes like this, that he showed up on a Saturday night having been at an open wrestling tournament with a black eye. And he was due in the pulpit the next morning. Um, and he preached in sunglasses. Um, and my mother said to him, again, this is the way the story goes, your wrestling career, Will it, that was his name, is over. You can help the kids at the high school, but no more of these open tournaments, particularly on Saturday night. You know, movie stars wear sunglasses when they do what they do. You're the preacher. People need to be able to look you in the eye. No more of that business. But he exposed me to it and my brothers to it. But perhaps uh, the greatest memory I have of going to a wrestling event with him uh, was at the NCAA wrestling tournament um, at, at uh, Cornell University in upstate New York, uh, 1964, uh, where there was a Japanese uh, wrestler whose last name was Weataki. He was the outstanding wrestler in the tournament. And he had come to Oklahoma State, all uh, places, because the coach, Myron Roderick at Oklahoma State, uh, had developed a, a friendship uh, with a Japanese uh, leader in the Japanese uh, national wrestling program, whose name was Hata. And Mr. Hata had two sons that he'd sent to Oklahoma State, uh, but he sent his finest wrestler uh, as a cultural exchange, if you will, uh, who, who won three national titles uh, for Oklahoma State, Yojiro uh, Wiataki. Uh, Wiataki in 1964, uh, went home and wrestled uh, for his, his native country, Japan, and won a gold medal. He won another gold medal in 1968. And the story goes uh, that Myron Roderick thought things were going so swimmingly in Stillwater, Oklahoma, that he said to Mr. Hata, have you got anybody else the likes of Wiataki? And he said, well, there is a young man by the name of Fujita. Uh, his English is not great, but he's very intelligent. Um, and he's a master in both judo and wrestling. Uh, uh, I think you, 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 would, uh, you would do well to try to recruit him to come to Oklahoma State. Long story short, uh, Fujita did go. Uh, won the NCAA championship, went home, and in 1972, uh, won the gold medal uh, for his native country of Japan. I, I subject you to all of this uh, because uh, I think there is something to it. Uh, this business of wrestling and struggling with God as an art form. And it is not something that belongs simply uh, to one people or to one culture. That it is, as in the case with other sports, something that can bring people together. Storytellers say that the Bible is so full of stories because they help people find themselves in it, but they also help people find themselves in the lives of other people. It's sometimes in other spiritualities called unity consciousness. It's in the high priestly prayer of Jesus in the Gospel of John that he says to the Father, may on our behalf, may they be one, may they learn to live as one, as we are one. Somebody said to me once, you know, on communion Sundays, we mean for you to be a little more brief. Almost there. Uh, the year was 1984, and I went with a minister friend of mine to see a movie that starred uh, Sally Field, uh, Danny Glover, uh, John Malkovich, it was called Places in the Heart. 
And Roger Ebert uh, was critical of it because he thought that uh, two, two main criticism, but the, the basic story is a depression era story. Uh, the sheriff's wife uh, is played by Sally Field. The sheriff gets killed and she's left uh, with cotton acreage on her hands and nobody to do the farming. Danny Glover shows up and blind John Malkovich uh, later shows up and somehow Ebert makes the point, they managed to form uh, a small farm family. Ebert didn't like that the, the script wandered from that. He thought that, that a better script would have been basically just about those people but life was messy. Um, and and, the, and the, the story goes in a direction that makes that plain. Uh, there were bad people that did bad things to one another. Uh, one man in the movie gets murdered, uh, un, much like happened to the sheriff, Sally Field's husband. And Ebert doesn't like this. Ebert, I, I would, for all my affection toward the late Roger Ebert, not really what you would call a religious person. His spirituality was a little different than ours. Um, but uh, the scene that he did not like is a communion scene. And it comes almost as the credits get ready to roll, where the camera uh, focuses on a group of people in the front pews at church, passing the communion tray uh, one to another. And as I said, I was watching this movie with a minister friend of mine. His name was Sam. And there's a, in, in this, uh, what almost seems like, at least it seemed to Ebert, like an odd addition. But to me, it was beautiful. Um, a man who was murdered in the, in the movie is seen taking communion and passing the elements to the man who had killed him. I, and, and Sam said to me, that guy's supposed to be dead. I said, Sam, pay attention. We try to do this for a living, you and I. This is, this is the gospel. Uh, in other words, we, we believe in grace and we believe in forgiveness. We try to live with courage and love in pursuit of peace. May it be so among us. Do let us pray. Our gracious and ever-loving God, we thank you for the means of grace, and we ask for the ability to live as your witnesses, that we might learn to imagine a world that is not yet, and express our commitment to it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I omitted one thing, and here's the story. I was in... Uh, New York City years ago.